Hello, Internet. Welcome to another episode of Reclaim Today. My name is Tim Owens. I'm one of the co-founders of Reclaim Hosting, uh, and I am joined today by Dr. Pete Rohrabaugh um, from Kennesaw State University. Isn't that right? Um, and we are talking a little bit today about, it. Pete, you had contacted me and basically said, I want to get off of Google. And I was like, okay, well, that's that's not a small thing whatsoever. So we should probably have a conversation about it and kind of talk about what that means. But, you know, I'll, I'll let you speak a little bit to this. But you you were interested in thinking through what that might look like. And obviously, of course, that leads down the technology path of what software might you need to kind of support the services that you're used to, whether it be email, uh, Google Drive, things of that nature and that kind of stuff. So I, you know, I thought this is a perfect episode for reclaim today because I you're not alone. I mean, you know, much like Facebook and Twitter and other social media and networks and technology companies, I think a lot of people are starting to take a much harder look at privacy, security, all those various things, whether, you know, like I said, I mean, even my wife is a huge TikTok fan and now she's suddenly thinking, I don't know, <laughs> you know, if that's a good idea or not. So I'm interested to hear a little bit about like what kind of drove that decision? Like, like I imagine this is not something that you just woke up one morning and just decided, you know what, I'm going to do it. It's been probably a culmination of a lot of events. So kind of talk to me a little bit about like where your head's at with this. Cool. Well, thanks for having me. I'll be glad to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that um, the beginnings of this kind of um, interest of mine go all the way back to the when I first started using social media. So um, I was a, a really reluctant social media um, person up until about 2010. And in that year, um, I had a postdoc at Georgia Tech and um, we were really being pushed to kind of explore digital environments differently. And I found a way that critical pedagogy and, and technology could, could kind of solve some, some double pronged problems for me. Um, but at that point, so many of my friends were already on it. Um, so that when I joined Twitter for the first time that year, uh, the only way that I cultivated a network on, on Twitter or used Twitter was professionally. So I never, mm -hmm. um, and I had avoided using Facebook um, up, up until then as well. So I never had a specifically like social, you know, like a uh, uh, boundaried social experience on social media. It always began from like a professional sense. Uh, and it cer certainly has become more social, but um, but I was really picky about how I did that because um, some parts of, of share culture I just didn't really get or understand. Um, and so I never I never joined Facebook. Um, there was a moment in uh, 2017 when there was a protest movement going on on my campus that I, I wanted to be able to communicate with people about. And the only way they were organizing was on Facebook. So I. I bit the bullet and opened a page for that year to communicate with those folks and then and then shuttered it. Um, and I picked up lots of social media platforms and played with them over the years. Um, but, you know, like carefully, critically. Uh, however, Google from the beginning has just always been kind of a central part of my Internet experience. I wrote my entire dissertation on Google Docs. Um, wow. yeah. And... Um, you know, I mean, have, have used it for probably hundreds or maybe even thousands of classroom activities and collaborative writing experiments and stuff like that. Even before I came to, you know, to kind of understand Domain of One's Own, uh, Google was was the thing that I really enjoyed the most and always felt um, comfortable um, with their decisions as a company, um, you know, up until the last couple of years. So. I would say that in the last three years, um, really around the time of, of, and we're going to talk about him in a minute, but around the time of Snowden, Edward Snowden's mm -hmm. disclosures and Cambridge Analytica, um, I really started kind of paying closer attention to even the resources on the web that I use, that I like, that I don't, that I didn't feel itchy about, um, and that thought, that concern, has just continued to. To kind of germinate so 
that by the end of last year, I had decided that one of my big goals for 2020 was going to be to experiment with pulling myself off of Google um, mm -hmm. in, terms of, in terms of email, in terms of cloud storage. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the one thing I can't figure out yet how to get around is a, is a phone. Once Reclaim starts making open source phones, then I'll be <laughs> really curious about that. But, uh, yeah, so, so I, you know, I started looking at these things, um, and I opened up a, an account with a company called Proton Mail that probably a lot of people have heard of, and they're an encrypted, um, end-to-end -end encrypted email service. I started using Signal because of some research, some research that I've been doing for the last two years has had me um, uh, interacting with or doing interviews with people in the Atlanta Antifa movement. And um, all of those conversations are, are you know, they're, they're very concerned about privacy. So, um, so I started using Signal about two years ago for that. And just increasingly I've become um, kind of just uh, like I, I, I try and slow down, you know, once a week and kind of pay attention to like w where my stuff is living and who owns it and um, and how much time I'm spending on particular platforms. But the real, you know, the thing that kind of really jolted me to contact you and to, to kind of accelerate this process was that I just finished a, um, I, I would say a reading, but it was a listening um, of the per permanent record um, memoir that Edward Snowden published uh, last fall, and it's basically yeah, like a and I, of life and and I haven't read that book yet, and it's interesting to me because I mean, obviously, I know who Edward Snowden is, and I, I was aware of sort of the NSA stuff and that kind of thing. But that book is fairly recent; I think it came out in 2019, uh, mm -hmm. and so I'm interested to to hear about like you know. Like, how does that play with Google? Because it's interesting hearing you talk, um, you know, it, we're almost at, and, and maybe it's a generational thing. I don't know. I don't want to pretend that I'm super young, but we're kind of at, at different crossroads because I was almost like raised up into social media, which I imagine sort of younger generations are. I had Facebook back in college in 2006. I had a Gmail beta account back when people were trying to sell them on eBay. And so I've had, you know, mm -hmm. Google accounts for a long time as well. And then, of course, you know, Twitter, I joined back when several of my friends were on there and that kind of stuff. And then there was the slow move into the professional. But it was it was sort of a thing of like, oh, you can use this stuff for professional purposes as well. But it was already embedded in sort of the, the culture of my surroundings in terms of using that stuff. And obviously, because of, you know, likely, you know, I would say probably because of my age, you know, when you're joining something in college, you're not thinking critically about it, especially not in 2006, 2007, right? <laughs> so, you know, that's something as well, where it's just sort of like, oh, Facebook's awesome, I can connect to people, I had no idea, you know, sort of the, the history behind why, you know, Mark Zuckerberg had created it and sort of the problematic aspects of it, mm -hmm. you know, all we knew is we're, our parents weren't on there. And so this is a great space where we can all kind of hang out and meet other people. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know if you want to, did you want me to set some background up on Snowden or just talk more specifically about like what reading that book has made me decide to do? Um, I or, guess, I guess a little bit of both. I mean, you know, like tell me a little bit more about, you know, in, in particular, you know, how the relationship to the book is kind of driving because it's it's a memoir right it's it's mm -hmm. sort of a history of his life and that kind of thing uh, mm -hmm. but i imagine it goes into some detail about the kind of things that he uncovered while he was working for the nsa right yeah so yeah so i mean he he you know documents his life as a nerd you know from birth to to his early 20s when he starts working for the government um, and his experience is much like you described of your own, where he was basically raised into many of these systems. Um, and to date myself, uh, my university, University of Georgia, didn't even start giving student students email addresses until the year after I graduated. So, um, so oh, yeah, wow. <laughs> yeah. email. Uh, I didn't get my first email account until I was uh, working after I graduated. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I think the biggest thing that this book taught me um and you know snowden i've just been kind of fascinated with as like a um as a an advocacy kind of figure and i know that he's kind of he's controversial obviously for lots of different reasons um 
is that I, you know, my concerns about privacy as they started to develop several years ago had way more to do with um, what Google or Apple or, you know, specifically Facebook, because I never wanted to be inside of that system, um, what they could know about me and what they could do with that information and the way that it's monetized and um, and algorithms that are used to ship me ads, you know, th those were my main concerns really up until about a year or two ago. Uh, but when you read this book, you, you know, we all kind of should have known if we were paying really close attention to that news that broke when, when he disclosed all of his stuff, which I think was in 2013 um, or 20, 2014. I, I'll need to go back and check that. Um, but, you know, the, the big thing that he uncovered was the fact that um, that without any kind of democratic order or policy, um, components of the NSA and the CIA uh, just began massive bulk collection of um, cell phone records and digital footprint records and metadata around calls and emails and stuff like that, um, scraping all of that stuff with the consent of those companies. And they were able to... The, the way that they were able at first to get around having to have a warrant for that stuff is they they made an argument that if they collected it, they weren't obtaining it. So obtaining, they would only count something as obtaining if once they had built this massive database, then they went in and searched you for your stuff. They originally said, well, that's what we would have to get a warrant for. We don't need to get a warrant to collect it. We just need to get a warrant to be able to look at it or search it. And even that um, even that boundary or restriction eventually eroded so that by the time that Snowden, you know, uh, packs up all, you know, copies a whole bunch of documents and gets ready to leave and disclose all of it to journalists, he can go in or, you know, intelligence workers can go into this, uh, this program called X key score and basically look up any American citizen and be able to have access to almost anything that that person is doing on a device. Um, with the consent of the, you know, the internet service providers and the third party companies, Google, Facebook, Twitter, um, whatever, they're just, they're just, they just are scraping all of that metadata. Um, and, and Snowden's point is that actually, you know, people are concerned about the content of things like the content of their email or the content of their text messages, but that actually he makes the argument that the metadata is actually more dangerous in bulk collection because the metadata can can reveal all kinds of things like where you are, how often you are at that place, um, and um, how often you're communicating with with specific individuals. Um, he mentions the, the fact that like if they're if they're really going after somebody, they can turn cameras on and off. Um, and these are all things that, like we joked about <clears throat> for years. You know, everybody, you know talks, you know, like talks about those ideas in a kind of tinfoil hat kind of way. Um, right. But it's actually, you know, reading that book actually made me kind of rerouted me back in the in the position of that the government, um, at least the intelligence community has has really won a major victory in this sense, if they have convinced us to turn that into a joke, you know, like if we, right. if we joke about that, and we know that it's possible, um, then we, we, we become, you know, like so much more willing, com complicit a agents in this equation than um, than we would have been uh, if if suddenly it was revealed that this was happening to us. Well, and you've got to assume, you know, that, that that's in partnership with these technology companies where, I mean, that the NSA and CIA and all these other folks must be thrilled at the idea that people are actually, you know, lining up to buy, you know, ring devices that'll put cameras on their front door and then, hey, maybe even put a drone in your house to kind of surveil your house in, in the name of security. And it's mm -hmm. it's wild to think like. Yeah, that would have been an absolute joke, the idea that people would put drones in their house or, or you know, like if somebody had said, oh, yeah, yeah, no, the, the government's going to put drones inside of our house, we would have said, that's crazy. It's like, yeah, because they're not, you're going to go out and buy them and happily, you know, log in, log in with your social media accounts to register the device and then connect it all to your to your data and that kind of thing. So it's it's just crazy how how times have changed in that regard. Yeah. yeah. And to see the extent, the um, you know, the extent to which the government went after him for that, and has obviously pursued mm -hmm. other people who want to reveal stuff like that, 
um, you know, his claim is just so um, it's so simple that uh, you know that we've just we've just conceded, we've just given over all of this privacy, um, right? And that, and I uh, wonder if some of that, I wonder if some of that erosion <clears throat> comes, you know, in light of nine eleven and the Patriot Act and mm-hmm. sort of this sense of like, you know you know, safety and security Mm -hmm. by virtue of surveillance, Mm -hmm. right? It was Mm -hmm. almost that mentality of like, well, normally I wouldn't, but, you know, Mm -hmm. we're in a different time and things have changed here. And with the Mm -hmm. the whole game, you know, the whole field has been leveled and now we need to suddenly think differently about a lot of these things. And and so in the name of, you know, security and and privacy for our country, we Mm -hmm. need to allow this. And if you're not, then, of course, you're not patriotic and Mm -hmm. maybe even and you're treasonous, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's yeah. certainly the context that he puts all this stuff in. You know, like I didn't know, I didn't know that he never graduated from high school or college. Um, mm-hmm. and that he was a yeah. self taught, you know, coder. Um, and the way that he describes his entry into intelligence work is just that in the aftermath of 9 11, nobody in the intelligence community knew how to work computers the way that self taught people like him did. And so his skill just allowed him to kind of rise in a meteoric way up through that organization because, you know, he, he, he was tasked with building, you know, he didn't know it at the time, according to the book, but um, he was tasked with building all of these systems that collected all of this information. And it wasn't until really his last two years or three years in intelligence that he realized that all of these little projects he'd been working on were part of this larger, you know, kind of um, data dragnet. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting because you said, you know, you, you've already made some motions to get off of Google services. It, surprisingly, you mentioned ProtonMail, which was one of my going to be one of my recommendations because I think mail is maybe one of the harder aspects. It, you know, a lot of people sign up for Reclaim hosting accounts and they think, well, I definitely want my own email address based mm-hmm. on my domain. And I'm like, you can here's the thing, you know, like you get a cheap $30 a year account, there's a good chance when you try to send email, it goes into spam, or Mm -hmm. you try to receive email and the spam filters aren't as good as what's with Gmail and those kind of things. And there are Mm -hmm. whole companies that not only think only about email 24 seven, that's all they do, but do it Mm -hmm. in a really secure and, and conscious way, which I think Mm -hmm. ProtonMail is a great example of that. And so, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you mentioned Signal and a few others where mm-hmm. it's so it sounds like you've already, as you said, been thinking about this and started to slowly extract some things. What mm-hmm. are what are the aspects keeping you there? I, I mean, do you still have a Gmail account? Do you still have, you know, you mentioned um, Google Drive, I think is probably mm-hmm. a big one that a lot of people grapple with, not just in mm-hmm. terms of storing files, but collaborative work mm-hmm. with those, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I mean, I certainly still have a Gmail account, you know, that's going to be a big day when I, when I decide to switch, turn the spigot off in one place and turn it on in the other. Um, and I'll probably leave the Gmail account open for a little while, you know, as I do that sure. transition. Um, but really the biggest, um, the biggest hurdle and the, and the thing that sent me to you is, um, is storage and the fact that, you know, I've got a, over a decade's worth of digital, pictures that have just been automatically backed up to Google Photos for me in a very easy, seamless, searchable, albumizable way um, for years. Right. And um, and I don't and I and I want to decamp from that uh, eventually. Yeah. And, and also I want to have, you know, tools for, you know, document storage and collaborative writing experiences. So, you know, I've looked a little bit, you know, I, I knew from the beginning actually as Google Docs was rolling out, that it was, as I understand, it's a mod, a, a kind of Google branding of another, a different open source project called Etherpad. Um, mm-hmm. And every once in a while, I check in on Etherpad to see if it's still a thing. Um, and, and I think, I mean, the last time I checked, it was. But I also know that there's plenty of open source uh, writing tools that, you know, could be used um, for that kind of thing. So, mm-hmm. you know, that, that kind of, shareable collaborative word processor function is something that I'm still looking for. So if you have a suggestion, that'd be great. But ultimately, the big thing that I want to do if Reclaim, uh, you know, if you guys have the resources for it is I want to take all of that storage that I have of documents and spreadsheets and pictures in Google and I want to put it on a server, you know, that I'm paying for uh, and that I know very well, you know, cannot be 
manipulated the way that all of that stuff that's sitting on Google servers currently can. And so that's that's my biggest kind of um, uh, question to you and to Reclaim is, do those services exist um, for me to move that stuff? And what does it cost? And then what applications do I need to start learning to figure out how to access that stuff? About a year ago, I started playing around an own, I think it's called own cloud. Um, yep. And I installed a, an instance of own cloud on my domain with you guys. Um, and I, you know, I didn't spend a whole bunch of time playing with it. Um, I left it alone. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious whether you guys, have, whether y'all have helped other people do this, whether there are people that, you know, have, have left big cloud data storage stuff and moved to storing it with y'all, which obviously is still cloud, right? But it's owned sure. by more, it's more owned by me because I'm paying for it. Is that right? Right. Yeah. I mean, you're always going to have different shades of gray. I, one of my biggest concerns, you know, from the get go when we started Reclaim Hosting was like, well, what if the what if the CIA or the FBI shows up at our doorstep and we mm -hmm. have to turn over information? How does that make us any different from Google? And, mm -hmm. you know, in some ways it doesn't. If you're a U.S. based company, you know, that's that's where maybe Proton Mail's got it going on because, you know, they're, they're out in Switzerland or wherever they are and they, they don't necessarily have to abide by the same rules and laws and regulations right. uh, as in the U.S., um, one of the things that we did, just as a FYI, down in the legal section of our website, if you go there, and of course there's terms of service and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, but we put what they call a canary clause in there, uh, which basically, because what happens is if the if a government agency requires you to turn over information about someone, they can also require you to not say that you did. Mm -hmm. which is really problematic. You know, you can't even admit we had to do this because of X, Y, and Z. They can mm -hmm. basically say, you're not allowed to talk about this at all. Mm -hmm. um, however, a canary clause is basically in your terms and basically says, you know, as long as this clause exists in our terms, we have never been asked to turn over anything. Mm -hmm. And so removing that canary clause, you know, it is a good indicator of, hey, they were probably asked to do something like that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, 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 you know, knock on lots of pieces of wood right now up to date, you know, we're, we're it's, uh, seven years old now. We have not um, been asked to do anything of that nature. So, I, but I think you're right. Like mm -hmm. the, the DIY and the kind of do it on your own, it's still going to require whether it's a raspberry hub in your living room or raspberry Pi in your living room, or if it's on reclaim hosting, I, I think there's varying degrees of open. There's varying degrees of, of how you can get off of these other services and things like that. OwnCloud, mm -hmm. I think, is a great example. And there's another project called NextCloud. And so this mm -hmm. is kind of an interesting history. So OwnCloud, um, you're right, that's been on Reclaim Hosting, and it's sort of seen as a Dropbox replacement, right? Mm -hmm. It's got apps for Windows, for Mac. You install it. You get folders on your computer that you can drop your files into, and it uploads it to the cloud or to your hosting account or wherever the case may be, wherever you've got own cloud installed. So mm -hmm. um, very easy to set up, very easy to just drop files in there, and it works. Um, own cloud had a bit of a fork with the developers that were involved with it a couple years back. Um, I guess a disagreement on how things were moving forward or how they were marketing things. And so a project was forked out of it called Next Cloud. And Next Cloud has become very popular. Um, I've actually got it up on my laptop here. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of this. And this is also available in Reclaim Hosting, Shared Hosting. Um, but uh, we'll also talk about some other platforms that might make sense if we're talking large amounts of data. But mm -hmm. what I find really interesting about Next NextCloud is that there are applications that are installed in addition to that whole file syncing thing. Mm -hmm. So they're really trying to market it as a solution, not just in terms of next cloud files which is that file syncing sharing files with other people desktop mobile web apps all that kind of thing but mm -hmm. also there's the talk section for calls chat web meetings there's mm -hmm. the groupware which is calendar contacts and mail and mm -hmm. most notably they don't do any mail server functionality but you can integrate through imap with other mail services so you could take your proton mail information but plug it into here and be checking your mail within the same section where you're managing your documents and that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um you know they've got collaborative things using something called um oh lord let me go here and take a look i, I believe it's called collabora 
Yeah, they talk about collaborating with documents. So this is something that we could certainly play around with as well. I think there's a lot of interesting things here. Um, but it, it's essentially that hub. It's that central workspace that allows you then to not just, you know, uploading the files is easy because, again, you've got a desktop application, you've got folders, and you can, you know, take everything and just kind of move it in there. And that mm -hmm. might be a good first step, like you said, is just getting everything onto a space that you own and control, but then using the plugins or the applications, they call them in there to to say okay all my stuff's in here now what can i do with it will i add the collaborative document editing thing on top of it and now all of my word documents become something that i can invite others to work with me on mm -hmm. i add the you know the image gallery functionality and all of a sudden all of my photos that are in here i can suddenly do something with i can take right. those folders and turn it in maybe to a public gallery for certain folders or i can kind of organize the metadata around them and so it's sort of building on top of just basic file synchronization with something where i think it offers a ton of functionality and because they're not having to build all of it they allow third-party developers the application is open source and people can build integrations on top of it then you can decide okay, what do I need to do? Is there an integration that currently exists for this? And you don't necessarily have to go outside of that box and say, well, I'll, I'll go and use this service. You know, you can actually use it within your account. Uh, what's really interesting about NextCloud too is I think they even have an application for the Raspberry Pi. So you could technically run NextCloud on a device, on a basically a miniature server that's on that's in your house. Now, there's reasons you may not want to do that necessarily, you know, internet connections go down, power goes out, that kind of stuff. There are certainly benefits um, to storing everything, you know, in a space that's, um, you know, more centrally managed and hosted and that kind of thing. Right. Um, one of the one of the concerns always, you know, with the shared, there's a couple concerns with shared hosting, which I believe has sort of been your experience with us Um up and up until recently shared hosting and domain of one's own were sort of the two p features that we had you know and shared mm -hmm. hosting was sort of for everybody and domain of one's own was more of an institutional version of shared hosting mm -hmm. um storage is always really difficult because you talk about large file sizes um mm -hmm. not individually but you know in bulk you know if you're talking you know hundreds of gigabytes of data it's just not mm -hmm. something you know because you know you're sharing server space with several other people on the on the system and then mm -hmm. there's finite limits to the amount of storage um and so that's always a concern the other thing is just sort of like our shared hosting space is really meant for web hosting uh web hosting can mean a lot to different people but again like i said we always shy away from email we kind of shy away from just hey throw hundreds of gigabytes of stuff on there and not do anything with it it's really meant for get a domain get a website up and running that kind of thing right. um we recently launched a product this summer called reclaim cloud yep. um which we've talked a little bit in previous episodes about and things like that and i think people are still coming around to understanding what it is and that that will be I think a journey and a conversation for probably years to come um, mm -hmm. in terms of what does the cloud actually mean. But one really cool thing about it is that it removes a lot of those limitations. So instead of buying a cheap shared hosting account and getting a slice of a server with a finite amount of stuff, you're basically paying for the raw resource usage. So mm -hmm. um, so in terms of NextCloud, you've got it up and running and you're paying 10 cents a gigabyte, you know, and mm -hmm. then from there per month, right? And so mm -hmm. then you can, you're can you only paying for exactly what you're using and you can mm -hmm. stop and start systems and that kind of stuff. And so um, I, in terms of flexibility, that's probably the way to go, especially when we talk about large amounts of storage. Um, there, there may be other workarounds too. We've had some folks who've used a shared hosting account to run the application, but then they'll use cloud storage to actually store the files. And that might take the form of like, um, Amazon S3, but again, that's Amazon storage, um, and that kind of thing, which has its own question marks and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff, but, um, mm -hmm. much cheaper again as well S3 storage, I think it's three cents a gigabyte. It's almost ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, and so I've had some folks who come with, uh, needing to run an Omeka install, but they are going to have terabytes of data. And so like S3 is a great thing for that. I think if you're somewhere in the middle and you don't need terabytes upon terabytes, because, you know, mm -hmm. while there are no limitations necessarily, we're also not Amazon. So I don't have a whole data center in my backyard with, you know, 
petabytes of of hard disk space and that kind of stuff. So we'd have to work with you on how much data it is. But Mm -hmm. if it certainly goes over the shared hosting limits and we're talking 200, 300 gigs of stuff or whatever the case may be, Mm -hmm. I think the cloud is a great option for that because you're only paying for what you use. It scales up and it's still 10 cents a gig, which can end up being, Mm -hmm. you know, fairly cheap. I mean, if you had 300 gigs of stuff, that would be 30 bucks a month. So, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not terribly expensive for what it is. Um, And projects like NextCloud would be absolutely supported in there. We could help you get it up and running. I think it offers something really interesting there because you might be able to sidestep just storing all your files somewhere and actually start off on the right foot by storing it somewhere where you can actually start to integrate on top of it. You've got a platform to be able to do that as opposed to saying, okay, well, I got all my stuff on a folder now and I see it in a file manager, but now what? Now I need something else, you know? Right. Right. So I've got two questions. Um, well, I'm probably mm-hmm. 5,000 questions coming off of what you said. <laughs> I'm limited to yeah. two. Um, the first one is, because uh, I have looked at the documentation that you guys have put up recently about um, about Reclaim Cloud. And, uh, you know, that in, in some ways, that was why I reached out. Um, so mm-hmm. in, when somebody has that um, service through you, th- you're not farming that out to an Amazon server, right? You are owning no. It, it belongs to you. You guys can put your hand physically on the computer where, where that stuff is, right? We lease the actual server. So we don't have a data. We're located in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and we don't mm-hmm. have a data center near here. And mm-hmm. so we we lease the servers from a company called OVH. And we have mm-hmm. servers in the U.S., in Canada, and in the U.K., but they are our dedicated servers. Right. And so these companies basically will set up a dedicated server for you, give you remote access to and have all the controls, and then you get a terminal and you you build out whatever you want to build out. So it is our hardware. It just mm-hmm. exists with a data center that's not owned by us because that's a whole nother level is to run your own data center. So sure, sure. yeah, but it, if I wanted to, yeah, I could probably drive up to the to Vent Hill in uh, Virginia and put my hand on the actual server. Right, okay. Now when people, this is a side note, but when people do use Amazon cloud hosting. Um, I mean, that, that, that kind of resource is not, um, as I understand it, it's not as perforated as something like what Google, like in other words, Google is able to mine all of my emails and, and advertise, you know, to me because of that. But when people, even if people are using Amazon cloud hosting, Amazon has promised not to dip into that data for their own purposes. Is that, that's what I have understood to be true, but is that true? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm not sure that I have the definitive answer on it either. That would be my assumption, but I'd hate Mm -hmm. to assume um, either way. I know Amazon definitely has. There's like big companies. Yeah, I was gonna say there's like big companies that like run massive amounts of their own. Oh, absolutely. So I, I can't imagine they would, they would be okay with that. Um, right. And then, you know, uh, the other thing that you can think about doing it, and I would say, you know, save this for after you start getting stuff on there. But one thing to think about, too, is encryption. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, you know, when you add encryption as another layer on top of it, you're not just putting your file somewhere, but you're encrypting it with a key which only you have access to. That means Mm -hmm. that even if I have access to the server and I were to open up and take the hard drive out, plug it in and look at the files on the server, I can't actually read any data of it because I don't have the credentials to be able to unlock that. So that's another layer on top. Typically, when we think of like websites and email, encrypted stuff starts to, there's always a performance side problem with that because it takes longer to access and read data Mm -hmm. and write data every because it's doing a lot more. It's not just putting it on a server, but it's encrypting all of it. But that might be Mm -hmm. something to look into as well. You know, that's why, you know, Apple gets a really good rep rep with this, you know, in terms of privacy, because like with their text messaging and with other things, everything is sort of end to end encrypted. You mentioned Signal. That's another example of end to end, you know, encryption in Mm -hmm. that if they wanted to, they couldn't read your messages. And that's one of the best cases for a company even like ours to be in is if people encrypt their data, I literally like, sure, I can turn it over. But when they say, well, we can't make any heads or tails of this, I say, neither can I because I don't have the keys to it. So Mm -hmm. um, that might be something to look into as well. My assumption is that you're right. I think Amazon is is 
it's at least at a different level, right? Like because you're you're really using cloud storage in a way where you're writing objects to a system mm -hmm. where they're not necessarily looking at it in the same way as like Google's whole business is that data mining. Not only, you know, do they have no problem doing it, but it's actually listed out as a feature. You know, we're going to crawl all of your emails. We're going to show you ads based on the kind of stuff that you're reading about. You know, like we're going to check all of your photos and tell you what they are and also suggest like minded photos and things like that. They market it as a feature, but that's exactly what they're doing. Amazon is not necessarily in that same business. They right. much like Reclaim Cloud, I would say they want you to use them for the resources. They want right. you to pay for the storage and pay right. for the actual resources that you're using. And obviously for companies like Netflix and others that are doing it at scale, that that equals quite a bit of money. Sure. And of course, Amazon's using it for their own infrastructure as well, which doesn't hurt. Right, exactly. So my second question um, has to do with, uh, I actually don't even know what to what bucket to put this question in, but, but I'll mm -hmm. set up this kind of context. So when we all started using, you know, I don't know people watching this may use Google Docs or not, but when we all started using mm -hmm. Google Docs, we did not imagine that it was going to be the the kind of foundational platform for writing and, and collaboratively sharing that it became. Yeah. So we didn't um, we didn't have to think very much at that point, like what if I have to leave this place? Because you know, like the frog in the water, like it just crept up on us. We blinked our eyes and four yeah. years later, you know, tons of our stuff is there. But yeah. once I'm thinking about, you know, okay, this is the first place that I actually have kind of really uh, created or generated a lot of data and I'm now getting ready to move it. You know, my questions are, am I going to be able to move it out of Google in a format that I can actually even access and, and use in that next cloud format or that, you know, on that server. And then almost more importantly, moving forward, um, you know, next cloud probably is not going to be around as long as Google, like Google, the one thing about, about Google that we can trust for a while is that it's going to be there. Um, right. So we don't have to think about formats that much because we're, we're pretty, you know, we can, we can believe with a lot of probability that that format is going to exist. If I move to next cloud, I can kind of assume at some point or points in my life, I'm going to have to, you know, move from like, not move the data, but, but uh, scale from next cloud to some other platform because next cloud is maybe nobody's working on next cloud anymore or something like that. So do I have to think about the format, whether it's like PDF or even like a lower level kind of like text, based uh, or, or kind of like a, I don't know how the right language to put it in because I'm, I'm way less, I'm way less computer science, science than you guys are. But do I have to think about what kind of format the program is in before I start dumping it into this other place so that it can even be read or used? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think, you know, especially when we think of like, PDFs can be really problematic because they're really not around editing. They're really around a presentation layer in which I can give you a PDF and it's going to look exactly right, even if you don't have those fonts installed, right. even if you don't have the images in a separate folder. I can just hand you one file and it shows everything. But again, like, you know, Adobe runs the PDF document. It's not really a good format for editing. Um, I know uh, Google Drive supports a couple different formats. Um, of course, Microsoft Word has been you know, sort of, you know, top of the list, you know, ever since the 90s, that's sort of been like the word processing standard is sort mm -hmm. of if, if your application doesn't support handling Word documents, then who are you, right? Yeah. So like, there's that side of things. Um, <clears throat> there is also something called the open document format. And I think this was pushed a, a very, very strong early on by a, a software suite called open office and mm -hmm. so that's sort of like the the open answer to microsoft word was the open document format it ends in dot odt mm -hmm. um i think there's similar ones for whether it be a spreadsheet or a, um, a presentation slides one interesting thing is that <clears throat> you can export to different formats and kind of play around with them. So I, I would encourage you, like, as part of this to see, like, what does work best. My guess is that in terms of flexibility, Microsoft Word format, if, as long as we're talking documents in terms of that, Microsoft Word for, for presentations, PowerPoint, uh, for spreadsheets, Excel, while it is sort of Microsoft and that's its whole another thing, the mm -hmm. flip side of that is in terms of interoperability, 
that's where it's at, right? Like, like every software tool that wants you to be able to work with documents is going to need to be able to support dot docx, right? <laughs> every presentation software wouldn't be worth their salt if you couldn't import PowerPoint slides. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to to follow that in terms of having the same oper interoperability to, between different software. And again, mm -hmm. I think that's where um, the, the archive options are really interesting too. So I know with Google, you can kind of say, I want a backup of all of my stuff. And it would be interesting to see what does that format look like? Like right. if you just tell Google, I want the archive of everything in Google Drive, what do they give you? Do they give you dot Google files, right? And, and what can, can you convert those and those kind of things? So I think it's, it's really Im important, you know, depending on, on your use case, right? So like, if it's just, I need to get the raw contents and move it over, Word doc is probably fine. It probably gets a lot trickier if it's like, I can't live without all of the comments on this document. So I need to make sure that I'm pulling it out in a format where all of the comments or all of the version history, does that even come out in an export? So thinking through those kind of things as well, you might say, well, you know, like for this, I don't care necessarily as long as I have the raw contents. And for this though, I need all of the comments on the side. I need the version history and all of those. Mm -hmm. But my guess is that either Microsoft Word or the open document format are going to be the two most compatible in terms of if there is a feature in there that's not Google specific, that it would probably come over in that format. Things mm -hmm. like Microsoft Word support track changes. They support commenting. And typically I found when I export a document in that format, it brings over all of those things that, that were in the Google document itself, which is nice. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I, and, and like you said, I think it, it's going to require me to do some experimenting and like how, uh, you know, like I don't want to pull all of that stuff out all at once. Uh, without being sure. aware of like what 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 it's going to look like when it comes across, um, yeah, and I think of it too, like you know, and that's why I think it would be interesting to find out like what would like a full export from Google look like in terms of you say you know they've got that what do they call it Google Takeout I think where where it's sort of like I want my backup of everything, and I imagine in some cases, and I found this to be the case like with Twitter archives where they give you the backup, it's and it's HTML files, and there's some JSON files and some all kinds of other stuff, and you might look at it and go, I have no idea how to use this necessarily. But maybe if you have the Word document and that's good, but then you've got all the other metadata in XML files or something else, as, as a historical thing, it might be good to just have that. And you don't necessarily have to have that living on NextCloud up on the whatever. You store that on a local hard drive somewhere. You keep it in a safe box or wherever you, wherever you need to just have that stuff and know that it's there. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes like when I've exported websites, this is a perfect example, like with a WordPress site. I'm closing it down. I want to convert it to static HTML because I don't want to manage the WordPress site anymore. So I'll convert the whole thing to HTML, but I'll still take a full backup of the database and I'll still make a copy of all the files and I'll store those together. And I know if I ever needed to recreate it, I could. Mm -hmm. And I still have all of the metadata around it, and, and the theme information, everything that I need to be able to rebuild it if I need to in order to access contents that I can't from that HTML version. Mm -hmm. But it's more of just the safekeeping of knowing, okay, this is the this is the true backup, but I'm converting it now to something that's more sustainable for what I need right now. So right. kind of keeping a copy of both, I think, makes a lot of sense, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, all of that is uh, helpful. And, you know, and, and it sounds like the, the, um, the Reclaim Cloud idea that you guys have, did, did you say you guys just kind of rolled that out this year? We did. We were in beta over the summertime, and then we launched it officially at the end of July. So yeah. um, it's a fair, fairly new thing for us. Uh, and it's, a, you know, it, in part for cloud is, is big because it kind of supports technologies that were never supported in cPanel, which was really huge for us. The ability to do Docker containers and run applications that you couldn't run before. I mean, we've even run like an open source Jitsi Meet instance to be able to do web conferencing within our um community and do stuff like that. Our community forums, which run discourse are on there. So we've been kind of eating our own dog food and doing a lot of our internal projects in there as well, just because right. the platform kind of supports 
all of that. So it's been it's been really great. And I think, you know, it offers a lot more flexibility. It doesn't mean that you couldn't start on your shared hosting account. Mm -hmm. But if you're planning to to move a lot of data over it, rather than starting one place and then having to do a full migration, it might make sense to just start off on the right foot right. and and get it get it going over there. And I could certainly right. help you with that. Cool. Um, I guess one last question, which maybe is a much longer conversation for later, but we can at least like hmm follow the arc the, the the top arc of it is um i did i did start experimenting a couple of years ago with that with that um application that y'all had some hand in or worked with ben word word muller word mueller on um called known um yes. and I, I know that known has kind of either changed or or kind of um i i don't know actually where known is right now but i i know that mm. fewer people are like picking it up and playing with it than I saw a couple of years ago. So is there, um, it, maybe it's that one, but maybe are, are there other um, open source applications that somebody can use um, and on their own domain that, that kind of recreate or, or that uh, model social media, but that, that where you own all of the stuff where the, you know, you're not going through Twitter, you're not going through Instagram, but you're kind of creating your own social media stream. Yeah, there's there's two with maybe a, a sidecar of one other that I'll mention. Known, I think, is a great one. So mm -hmm. Known is still around. It's still an um, it's primarily now an open source project. So I think that was the big shift. Was for a while there was a commercial entity, and um, yeah, Ben Wordmuller was running it and sort of running it as a business, but it was always open source as well. Now it's just the open source component mm -hmm. making up that infrastructure, and it, and of course then that has the side effect of you're relying now on open source. And so is there a community to keep it updated and that kind of thing? Um, mm -hmm. It is still, you know, solid software. I know a lot of people in the indie web community are still using it um, as a way to publish on your own site and then syndicate or push it out to Twitter, to Facebook, mm -hmm. to, to all those various spaces. So that's mm -hmm. definitely still around and a good option. Um, another one that I hear a lot about, and now this is one that um, is not able to be installed on your own domain. You can map a domain to it, um, but it's a very solid company. Um, it's called Microblog. Uh, mm -hmm. And Microblog, um, I've, I've been seeing more and more from a lot of different folks. In fact, um, the community manager for Microblog was just in one of our Domain of One's own meetups recently um, that, uh, that Chris Aldrich has been putting on as part of the IndieWeb community. And so they support a lot of the similar underlying IndieWeb principles in terms of federation, in terms of syndication and that kind of stuff. And I've seen, you know, people like Dan Cohen on, um, on Twitter are, are publishing on microblog and then pushing it out to Twitter. And so mm -hmm. while the name is deceiving, it's not really just a blog. People are using it for short status updates as well and then pushing those to Twitter. Um, people are using those um, as sort of a replacement uh, in some ways for the social media. And they definitely do seem like the kind of company. And I think they've got a blog post where they kind of explain why they didn't go down the route of trying to build it as software that could be self-hosted. There's all, obviously always going to be a balance for a developer about how sustainable that is versus your core focus. Um, and so microblog is another one. And then the other one that I'll just mention briefly, but I've only pr played with very briefly. And it seems to me at least much more just as a Twitter focused replacement is Mastodon. Yeah. Um, again, Mast Mastodon is supporting federated protocols. You know, you can you can run it yourself. You can communicate with other instances that other people are running, and then of course there's shared instances like the main Mastodon website that you can just sign up and get an account. Right. All of your data is portable in that sense, and that seems um, uh, very similar types of uh, communities that those sort of indie web principles. So those are the three off the top of my head that I can think of in terms of ease of use and install, I think known is probably still at the top of that list. Mm -hmm. um, but I would encourage you to maybe check out microblog um, and Mastodon as two potential other scenarios of different ways. And I think it just depends, like, you know, what social media are you trying to either recreate or syndicate to? And where's the support for those kind of things? It seems Mastodon's very easy to kind of dual post there and Twitter. Mm -hmm. But if I wanted to use it as a Facebook replacement, probably not. Like, there's mm -hmm. probably not a whole lot of integration there with that. It's really meant about short status updates. Microblog, to me, seems a lot more 
similar to known in that it's it's your own space you're posting photos you're posting status updates you're posting everything you know and then pushing those out to the various places where your other communities are whether that be twitter or facebook but keeping it central to that to that area as well so yeah great well this has been super useful stuff tim i, I really appreciate it and you know obviously this stuff this uh, these moves for me are not going to happen overnight um but i do yeah. you know i i do still you know kind of have a have an interest in completing some you know uh bulk of this work by the end of the year mm -hmm. so you know i'll definitely be in communication with you guys about um reclaim cloud and um mm -hmm. playing with with that next cloud um software i really yeah i'd i'd love to yeah, I'd love to have a follow up on this and kind of see where you are with it and things are going and you've actually inspired me. I'm going to need to sign up for like a Proton mail account and a Signal account because you're already well ahead of me on those things. And and so I I think it's a, it's a good reminder, I think, for for everybody that the experimentation is good and really just like continually refining and playing around with the things. And it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. You don't yeah. have to quit everything today and try and rebuild it. And that that can often end in frustration where you go like, well, I've got to use Google because I tried yesterday to push mm -hmm. everything to one thing and it just didn't work. I think it can right. be iterative steps. It can be yeah. a slow progression over time where you take up little pieces of it like, okay, right, I'm going to keep my Gmail, but I'm also going to have this account over here and I'm going to map my domain to it. And to right. me, like that's also the power of mapping domains, right? Is that like that's like your central authority, that's your truth, right? Is mm -hmm. is your domain. And then you switch what email client you use underneath of it, nobody knows, right? You mm -hmm. switch whatever hosting company or whether website software, people are just going to a URL. So mm -hmm. like to I, that's to me why it's always been so important for people to get their own domain. And as much as services can allow that, mapping domains on top of it does give you that flexibility to kind of tinker around in the background and say, I'm going to try this for a little bit. Now I'm going to try that, see mm -hmm. what works, what doesn't, and have a slow progression towards, you know, something that you have more control over. Yeah. So I, I appreciate the conversation. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. I mean, when I was, when I was finishing up that book, the, the one thing that struck me was how embedded, this is just my last comment. I'm sorry. Um, how oh, you're fine. <laughs> embedded he was in um, a bunch of like, you know, really top secret, scary systems, and how difficult it was for him to extract himself from those with yeah. the goal of coming forward with all of this stuff. And I just thought, you know, like, that's the position you don't want to be in, you know, you don't want to be trying yeah. to solve, you know, everybody, you know, like people that I think don't, don't, um, ha haven't looked into these privacy issues are often like the first thing out of their mouth is, well, why would you want to do that if you don't have anything to hide? Um, the issue is mm -hmm. like, you want to figure these things out before or if you ever do have something that you want to keep to yourself, it's easier to yeah. solve it when you're not, you know, like under some kind of political or legal um, pressure to figure that stuff mm -hmm. out, Better to figure it out when you, you don't have any pressure and you just kind of want to learn, you know, I don't, I mean, I'm not, a, a, I, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't want Google going through all my stuff, but I'm also not hiding government secrets. Um, but if I end up, if I ever end up in that situation, I want to have figured this stuff out first. Um, so yeah, yeah. start starting with, starting with the assumption that you know I all of my stuff is mine, it's private, and then to the extent that I want other people to have access to it, I think it's like you said, it's 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 very hard to to. Um, you know, roll that back, you know, after you've already done it and it right. takes time and it takes work. So yeah, right. well, I, I, again, dude, I appreciate the conversation. I look forward to talking with you more about how things are going, how we can support you with it. Cause you know, you're certainly not alone in thinking these things. I think a lot of people are thinking really hard about like surveillance culture, privacy, security, all that kind of stuff. And it's also hard like that. This stuff's not easy. Right. So, you know, but it's gotten easier. There, there are a lot more options, though, out there. And sometimes that I think, too, can be paralyzing. So I appreciate the conversation. Look forward to more. Yeah. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it, Tim. Awesome. All right. Take care. Take it easy.